So warm welcomes to everyone here. Thank you for coming. I'm Myung, currently in diploma and here representing AA Action with Anahita. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Anahita, and I'm also a part of the diploma program. And I'm also representing AA Action with Myung. So for today's roundtable, we have Elif and Milad uh, of the AA MTech program. Um, who are collaborating with Hassel Studio and have exhibited the re-emerge pavilion in the Bedford Square with their team. And we have Elisa, who is an artist, who is currently exhibiting at the front members room. And the exhibition is called the Reclaimed Chaos Exhibition. The conversation will revolve around the politics of material reuse and its wider impact in the context of the climate crisis. Um, a little bit of an introduction to AA Action. So AA Action uh, was initiated in 2019 and it was initiated as a student-led project at the Architectural Association committed to bringing about the necessary pedagogical and cultural shift in architectural education in order to effectively work towards climate justice. In 2019, AA Action took a big part in drafting the Architectural Education Declares Manifesto with an inquisitive, open and continuous approach. We delve into pre-established discourses and practices through which architecture engages with climate change. We have had a series of events, lectures, seminar discussions, workshops, etc. So also we have a lecture series coming up in second term, which will, uh, the conversation will revolve around economics and climate crisis with uh, speakers from various fields. So please join us. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Elisa. So she was a recent graduate from AAIS. And then also she's an interprofessional artist working at the intersection of public art, art architecture, performance, health, and climate psychology research, as well as education. It's my pleasure to now introduce um, Dr. Elif, who is the Director of Emergent Technologies and Design Postgraduate Program. And she's also an architect and a researcher. Her research in interests include the role of individual building with, within complex urban systems, the exploration of urban data as, de as design drivers, biomimicry, and robotic design and fabrication. We have also have with us today, Dr. Milad, the Studio Master of Emergent Technologies and Design Postgraduate Program, who is also an art architect and a researcher. He is also the co-director of the AA Istanbul Visiting School with the research focus on integration of algorithmic design methods with large scale digital fabrication tools. Um, thank you so much for coming here today for this round table discussion and you know, having a conversation about both your projects. Thank you. So to give you a brief introduction to today's agenda. So we will start with a short presentation from Elisa and Milad and Elif from MTech. And then we will that will be followed by the roundtable discussion. The roundtable discussion will first start off with the questions from us, and then we'll open the table to the floor. Um, and then there is drinks. <laughs> yeah. So um, my project Reclaimed Chaos is being installed in the front members room at the moment as part of public programs. And it was originally a part of a TV series, a six part TV series titled The Next Big Thing that was aired on London Live earlier this year. So I was selected as a winner in the sculpture category. What I am making artwork, it's about this narrative, narrative of people's lives and how we are essentially you know, a reflection of nature. We are part of nature. And I'm really interested in how uh, we uh, in this community think about climate and climate psychology and what our experience of being in an urban space is. I'm thinking about having this figure as the central pose and trying to capture um, the dynamic expression of, of, I suppose, being the recipient of external stimulus, but also pushing it back out. It's, it's almost like it's created its own arc, its, its own shelter. Mm -hmm. I want it to feel dynamic, like yeah. London is, yeah. and to get lost in these yeah. networks. 
So here's a sketch for my proposal for the next big thing artwork. And you can see I'm going to make it in the corner of my studio here as a puzzle and then reassemble it in the gallery space when it comes to the installation. So then became my uh, journey for sourcing reclaimed wood across London. So it was during the lockdown and I literally would step outside of my studio. Here at the construction site and at listen. Bishop's Court. <laughs> and the guys here have been really kind. They said that they're going to find some scrap pieces of wood for me, which are behind this skip here. And this is my assistant, Sarah. She was very helpful. <laughs> and so I just literally went by foot around the streets in the because peripheral I found timber. <laughs> and hunted down timber wherever I could. We are on a timber journey. <laughs> so these look like they've been pieces of timber. I don't know what they would have been used for. What do you think? Were they, I think they were from an old bed. <laughs> So it was just a challenge fantastic process, in a way that really. self-support can come apart yeah. and will still be structurally held together while capturing. I want it to capture a feeling of chaos and magnetism in a sense that yep. they're holding themselves together, bound by energy as opposed to bound together by obvious structural solutions. This is the first time I've actually been able to create a piece in my studio in London and have it in a gallery in London. You happy? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah? I mean, to be honest, installing it um, after disassembling it, transporting it, I was hugely apprehensive of A, structurally, how it was going to be able to fit back together. Yeah. Um, and yeah. as you can <laughs> tell, I felt quite insane of constructing a chaotic structure and then pulling it apart, alphabetizing it, and then trying to put it back together. I was like, what am I doing? Um, but actually, once we put the main pieces back together, it just, it locked in. Yep. And then I really enjoyed the whole process of them being able to work in with all of the white pieces. So then this was the final artwork that was exhibited in the Old Design Museum there. And unfortunately, it was originally intended to be open to the public. But because the lockdown continued on, it was only a private viewing space. Um, but it was an interesting process as well of documenting a very three-dimensional uh, sculptural journey that was essentially shared via the screen um, and really brought in the process-based nature of the way of working. And then led me to having to disassemble the sculpture and I pitched it to the AA public programs to exhibit it there. And I, I pulled apart the concept a little more thinking about, you know, the context um, and the narrative and the figure as the three main essential aspects. And here are some images of what I propose to present at the AA. And uh, this time though, however, reconstructing the sculpture, it was not alphabetized. I completely disassembled the structure and we had to fully redevelop it for the space here, like working within the structural limitations of the site and responding to the heritage listed aspects such as the window and the window frame. And really it required me to take a step back and reflect about how to work with the same concept and yet really redevelop it with, um, with the people who were around, which were the maintenance crew at the AA who were really, really helpful and also a few student assistants who came and helped me. And you know, this essentially was the most important aspect for me. It was about reconnecting to community and the community of the AA, which I felt as a student I had missed out on. And that is also what it gave me in the first iteration of the project as well. In a time of isolation, it enabled me to meet people, to actually go out and sourcing timber was a way of, of finding the narrative of the work as well. You know, within this moment of time when the world is sort of falling apart where, you know, London is a very dynamic city and we are suddenly thrown into a moment of pause. 
and what does it mean to to stop and to hold your breath and that's what I wanted to capture in the artwork thinking of the figure the central protagonist as a universal character maybe London embodied within in the body and then the you know the the structure around it as almost being like energy portrayed in a visual sense and that you know it's it's perhaps like a concept map that's visualized and brought into the three-dimensional space and each section is almost like an interconnected thought and and I suppose it really got me thinking about what I wanted to express to the artwork that was my objective to capture the spirit of London through an artwork and I was like, am I even qualified to be commenting on what the spirit of London is? I've only been living here a very short period of time. I experienced six months of the city uh, before it was thrown into the pandemic. And then at the same time, I was experiencing via distance um, my own personal climate-based disaster that was um, impacting my home in Australia. And that was the Black Summer um, of 2019 to 2020. And it was it was really traumatic for me personally. I wasn't there physically affected. But again, watching globally televised uh, across the world, my intimate parts of my home, my family, the, the landscapes that I'd grown up, the trees that I'd grown up climbing, being decimated. And hearing stories recounted and relayed of people being displaced, of you know, of people trying to regenerate, of rescuing animals, and just the the grief and the fear. And I felt really helpless. I felt guilty that I wasn't there. And and I think that these overlaying disasters, compounding, um, you know, the pandemic and the climate crisis and different climate based disasters it really threw me into a very personal state of panic and anxiety and grief and disassociation. I got to points where I could not focus anymore. I disconnected in order to be able to function on a day-to-day -day level. And, and then, it, you know, I was struggling. I was really struggling with that. And it really got me into exploring into the field of climate psychology of how, you know, ways in which we can investigate the psychological impacts of the climate disasters or climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, trying to look into methods of ways to, in order to be able to reassociate with it and to explore the emotional aspects mm -hmm. as well as the technical aspects. And, and I suppose trying to explore um, behavior of what impacts our behavior regarding action within the climate crisis and also how our behavior, you know, again, it's like in the artwork, it's a cyclical thing. We are part of it. It's a human centered crisis. So that, that was my story. So I hope that that gave an insight into how I was using reclaimed wood that intersected with the narrative of the work. Thank you so much, Elisa. That was a really great introduction to your work and also your personal story through your, uh, through your artwork. Now we will move on. We would like to move on to the next presentation so, uh, by Elif and Mila. Yeah. It's a video that will around seven minutes, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so thank you to A Action, first of all. I think uh, we think A Action is a really great initiative to be working across the AA on issues of climate change and awareness of, about climate change and how that can be reflected back to the education across the school. Um, so thank you for this, this opportunity. Um, I'm not going to do a very thorough introduction about MTEC, but I just want to say a couple of things that um, MTEC has had an interest in building lightweight constructions over around two decades. Um, and it's, it's had a specific interest on working with timber. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I mean, scale-wise, we have been interested in working on issues that are related to climate change, lack of biodiversity, uh, changes in population patterns, their densities, so on and so forth. So uh, issues that we are facing with, uh, existing problems that we are facing with, and how we can address these issues through you know, an ecological approach, architectural approach, uh, local material approach, so on and so forth. So this 
pavilion actually was a really good chance for us, I believe, to unite in a way those two ambitions. So coming up with a construction that is self-standing and as lightweight as possible, uh, but also that can reflect on what is going on in the world with the resources that we have. So it was actually very interesting. I mean, two things were very interesting. So first the interesting point was the timing of this collaboration. Um, Hassel Studio approached us back in May when we were just coming back to London and we were, when we were just kind of emerging from this fully online phase to kind of partial online on-site phase. And that's when Hassel Studio approached us to ask, you know, hey guys, <clears throat> would you be interested in building something on Bedford Square? And I mean, obviously we were very much interested in that because, you know, first of all, it kind of revives the tradition of building something on Bedford Square, which has been going on for years, as you might know. And second of all, you know, as I said, it was a really good timing. It was the first time we were meeting our students like face to face. So it gave us a really good chance to really work together on this very closely to, to do a lot of experimentation. Um, and yeah, and the second important point was that it was actually Hassel Studio who suggested that we experiment with uh, reclaimed wood. That was interesting because, you know, there are in industry partner. So it was really good to see that the industry is also showing interest in using reclaimed well, wood in this case or reclaimed resources, because, you know, we are living in a world where we, we have limited resources. And so we need, we really need to be aware of uh, what are the potentials of reusing those resources. So, you know, going from recycling to upcycling. Um, so that's how we started basically. So um, during the summer, we went through a whole process of material experimentation. We went to a lot of recycling facilities around London, uh, outside London to collect. And I think that kind of resonates with your story of trying to get as many pieces as possible. So. Yeah, I mean, we went around to collect as many timber planks as we could. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, then the question was, okay, are these usable for a self-standing structure? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, the kind of first challenge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started with a lot of material experiments um, and the logic behind how this structure came to be is that we didn't want to just, for example, stack as much material as we could. We wanted to give it some kind of volume and, and porosity, and at the same time, think about how they could be joined to each other in, in the simplest way and without using secondary joiner systems. So that's how this kind of um, diamond, what we call the diamond shape came to be. Um, so through that understanding of material behavior, then we were thinking about, okay, so what is this structure going to look like, going to look like, and what is the, that, what is the kind of aggregation process, you know, that we can, that we can experiment with. So that then takes us to our computational and assembly processes. I mean, as you might know, in MTEC, we love to work with computational processes, and that's for a reason. Is, is really to understand material behavior and to kind of embed that in the process of how these timber planks can join to each other. Uh, so obviously in this case, it was quite particular because each of the timber planks were different. So there is no way of standardizing the process, the, com the, the, the computational process. So that was one of the challenges. Um, and through that kind of iterative testing, uh, you know, we came up with an assembly sequence. Obviously, that has its own challenges as well, which we might maybe touch on later. Um, and for us, um, in this process, what was very important is, okay, we are using reclaimed timber. What is the benefit of this? So what does, rec what does using reclaimed timber mean? And how can we quantify that? Um, about the quantification of using reclaimed timber. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to add what Elif said, uh, we took a very um, numerical and scientific approach towards using reclaimed timber. We wanted to know the real impact of using such a material, not necessarily just a name itself. 
just to give you some figures, uh, the carbon footprint of this particular project while using reclaimed timber is something around like five to 10% of the carbon footprint of the project if it was built from the completely new material, timber planks or plywood. And this was one of the very important consideration and design drivers we've had from the beginning. The arrangement of the ribs, the arrangement of the morphology itself also was informed by the CO2 emission of the project. And this has been a design driver from day one in the entire process. The other thing that happened very um, as a byproduct of this project was to creating a protocol workflow, both computational and physical to work with reclaimed material. And as an academic institution experimenting with reclaimed and reusable material, it put forward a very important agenda that leading towards creating a repository of information and knowledge that can be later used by our students who experience this back into the practice later. Mm -hmm. This is one of the important aspects that we try to explore here in the project by bridging the gap between practice and academia in a meaningful way mm -hmm. in a framework of a research agenda. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, for the brief introduction of the project as well as MTech. Um, I think we can begin the round table with a few questions that we've prepared um, in context of both of your works. Um, so in 2020, the UK generated about four and a half million tons of waste wood. This wood comes from a number of different sectors, including construction, demolition, mm. manufacturing and wood processing. Both your projects, the Re-Emerge Pavilion and the Reclaimed Chaos Pavilion, engage with the reuse of materials, specifically timber, by reclaiming and repurposing material that was at the end of its life cycle, you were able to materialize its potential even further. Can you elaborate a little bit on your reflections on the journey of the material as you work through the project? Maybe we can start uh, with Elisa, if, if you can kind of give a little bit of your, um, you know, a little introduction to the journey of the life cycle of, of timber through your project. Thank you. Fantastic question, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned on it before, I mean, right through the process, I'm very much interested in the interrelation between working with the material and the people that you're working with and how, you know, if you really think about sustainability, I'm thinking about sustainability across the wellness sector. And so how health and environmental sustainability overlap. So I think that I'm always trying to figure out ways of working that that have that effect on me personally, but also the people that I'm working with or the communities I'm working with. And, uh, and like I think I mentioned before, the process of sourcing the material achieved that as well. It brought people together. It's, um, you know, it was about learning, not just physically where this material came from, but it was also about learning the narrative of the material, the narrative of the people who are working with the material, who are maybe know come from really different professions and what they've learned about where this material came from or how they need to deconstruct it um, and then also learning how to strip it back some of the wood that I collected was really rough mm -hmm. really rough and it took a, and I think it was surprising when I first started to work with the material how much work it really takes to um, to understand the resourced material and to be able to denail it or sand it back or going through all of this process. And, and I think that that is a big part of learning about it. And it's a, it's a sensory experience as well. I mean, different timbers have different scents mm -hmm. and you're learning about the nails or the fixings that mm -hmm. they've been used before. And, and I will try to reuse all of those aspects too, if they're in a workable state. And each time that I will reuse a material, say for the, the reclaimed chaos sculpture, it was deconstructed and then reassembled and incorporated almost like a, a tumbleweed, like incorporating new material in each location that it will go to. And in that way, it, it is building up the narrative mm -hmm. of that material. And I would try to find em half empty tins of paint as well on the street or 
you know, reuse screws or any material. So not just thinking of the, the initial material, but all of the additional processes mm -hmm. trying to work as ethically in a sustainable way. Thank you, um, Elisa. Um, yeah, um, for the for the re-emerge pavilion, I was also wondering the same. There was a question about you know uh, this sort of uh, journey about finding first finding the 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 timber that's that's and then reclaiming it and claiming it again with with the with the installation. Right. Any thoughts on this on the same? Yeah, I mean we've we've had a lot of thoughts on that <laughs> actually. Now, I mean this is the second life of this of mm. these timber planks so starting from day one when we uh, were challenged with this brief or working with uh, reclaimed timber we were like okay so what's going to be the third life you know because i mean this is an ongoing process how can we make the best use of these materials so that was actually our first kind of challenge what happens to this pavilion after it's disassembled and you know we have some thoughts and um, uh, projects about what's going to happen to it afterwards. Which you know part of it will go to the recycling facilities, mm -hmm. actually back back to where they came from. Part of it will go to Hassel Studio, and part of it might be showcased somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, we think the pavilion itself brings together people who actually haven't met. But those are the important stakeholders, you know, so like the recycling people, us, you know, our sponsors, Hassel Studio, many of these people haven't actually met, but they all worked on this pavilion mm -hmm. from various perspectives and aspects. So in a way, we think, you know, in a time where we have kind of limited access to each other because of this COVID, it was a really good kind of opportunity to unite them under, you know, working for this pavilion in one way or another. Um, I mean, as, as Elisa said, we also learned a lot about the material itself. You know, you cannot just place timber planks on a CNC bed. Mm -hmm. You need to denail them. Some, sometimes you need to smooth them. You definitely cannot score any, anywhere you want on the timber planks. You need to make sure there are no nuts, for example. You need to make sure that that area of the timber is, is stiff enough. Mm -hmm. So that also, for example, led us to eliminate a lot of planks because we had to work with planks that we could see and see for scoring purposes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, when you work with, let's say, new materials, you never have these concerns. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you work with reclaimed materials, you need to respect the material's history, mm -hmm. whether it's nailing or nuts or whatever it is. So it's really much very much about understanding the materials properties and its history mm -hmm. and how to embed that in these kinds of fabrication mm -hmm. workflows. I mean, just to highlight one important thing that Elif said was bringing people that they haven't met. Mm -hmm. And as a byproduct of this particular gathering of people that they haven't met, we had to invent some mediums of communication Mm -hmm. and workflows to enable this um, meeting point to be conclusive. Mm -hmm. So this was a very learning process also for us uh, as a collective team who has been like leading this project. And I think it was very informative for all of the stakeholders in the project of how this different stakeholders in a, such a, a project can come together and create a um, meaningful project that has a particular conclusion at the end. Um, just to kind of um, talk a little bit about the kind of, you know, as you both mentioned, designing with reclaimed material is kind of almost very specific. It's very different than working with, you know, material that you just source that's new. So um, how does how does that very specific, um, you know, reclaiming guide your design? So there were kind of a few talks about, you know, flexibility and quality yes. control in one of the talks yes. um, previously yes. about how, you know, there is not much as much flexibility as you can imagine but you have it's up to the designers to kind of you know uh, design that level of control of flexibility and the mm. quality of the material as you yeah. source them and sort them yeah, yeah. any thoughts on the same yeah i mean shall i 
Shall we? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think what you mentioned about quality control is very important because I mean, there are no kind of, um, let's say, building codes uh, in a way to examine reclaimed timber uh, if it can be used in a in a building scale or not. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is one of the challenges that needs to be addressed in the building industry. You know, in this case, the quality control was us. I mean, we were checking each plank. Yeah. Our, our, our students were checking each, each plank if they can be reused or not, mm -hmm. right? So that takes a lot of time and um, there are no set rules for this. So that was one of the challenges. Um, another challenge in our case, was because I mean we you know work with like these form finding processes, assembly processes that are mostly computational. Um, and usually these processes are geared towards materials that come in specific sizes mm -hmm. and materials that have specific connection details and specific tolerances. But in this case we had to let loose of that. Yeah. Every piece was different in terms, I mean, they were similar, as you can see outside, but they were very much different as well. So it was very much about how can we embed this differentiation uh, or redundancy, so to speak, in terms of, you know, each size is different. How are we going to incorporate this into mm -hmm. a workflow? That was, that was a real challenge for us. Yeah. I mean, we kind of went around it, but it was a, <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, and then Lisa, because I think you also mentioned the idea of sorting while you're presenting. Yeah. So how? how yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there's there are similarities and differences between our two projects. And I suppose one really important difference to mention is that your project is outdoors and in public space. Whereas the project that I've created, Reclaim Chaos, in both of the times that it's been exhibited has been in an interior space mm. where I've had not, I have not had to consider as many structural constraints and I have not had to go through as many approval processes. Mm. And so I do know that previously in other public art projects where I've created timber structures for outdoors, it's been a real challenge to work in the way that I want to work and get it approved by engineers and councils because they're like, mm, so, right, right. What's the quality of the material? And I'll say like, there are some really strong pieces and that does not satisfy them. And uh, <laughs> some of them are quite yeah, I really had to. And they're like, oh, but it's an, but like, well, where are your main structural connections? And then I say, well, you know, network structures are a real thing as well. It's very strong. And again, they're like, okay, prove it to us. And so I've, I've had many arguments and very, you know, civil arguments mm -hmm. in those respects. Um, and, and I have to admit, it's a lot easier to be working on these interior projects, like, a, like Reclaimed Chaos. Mm -hmm. And I did not have to be as uh, specific about, mm -hmm. you know, the structural limitations there. I, it could be more based on aesthetics. There were a few pieces that of course formed the foundational structure of the artwork. And, and I could tell what they were, you know, you, sure. you, but I did not have to pass any building codes or regulations. Mm -hmm. And other times when I have created public artworks using these materials, I've sometimes, I hate to admit it, but I've had to use some new materials to form the, the main structure of the piece mm -hmm. and then I would get approval and then um, I would be allowed to use the reclaimed wood that was not performing the main structural uh, function of the artwork as cladding or as mm -hmm. building up the bulk of the material and so sometimes it you know it that bothers me but then at the same time it's it's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I think that you're right, that it would be fantastic if there were more systems in place yeah. um, to be, to be able to approve the use of reuse materials and that things, you know, these systems shouldn't be based on only being able to work yeah. from very standardized, you know, uh, qualities and measurements that you can only get approved from a store and then have it on your receipt. And, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that needs to be a system change. Yeah, yeah. So actually, that leads on to another question of, I think, similar to, so what do you think there's like organizational structures or infrastructure that can encourage people on reusing or reclaiming uh, materials, especially timber? Because you first mentioned there's like 
uh, quality control and the systems mm. missing as well. So, I mean, I, I really do think that, you know, since everyone recently, especially are so aware of of climate change and the 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 effects that it brings, you know, we we have COP twenty six going on right now. Yes, countries are trying to reach um, some agreements about the future and so on and so forth. I mean, it's it's really I think it's important to reflect on how the building industry mm-hmm. is going to take take those actions further. Mm-hmm. Um, at least from our experience, you know, if reclaimed materials are going to be part of our built environment, then, I mean, again, going back to our previous um, comment, it, it needs to be part of the building code. Yeah. There needs mm-hmm. to be ways of assessing materials so that, you know, we don't visually go on and on about, you know, oh, is this usable or not? Mm-hmm. You know, that's not reliable. So there needs to be building codes that are applicable to different types of buildings and spaces mm-hmm. and, um, I think that the industry, I mean, there is some interest from the industry, obviously, as we can see, Mm -hmm. but how can we ensure that the industry is a more integral part of this transformation? Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. it's quite important. You know, um, I think these are very good experiments, you know, both both the um, installation and the pavilion, they're good experiments, but we all collectively with the industry need to think about how will this become part of the wider architectural Mm -hmm. domain? Mm -hmm. Will we be able to build buildings at some point? Uh, One important aspect of this, I think, would be the dissemination of the knowledge produced in this process. It shouldn't be buried Mm -hmm. as few photos and videos. I think the workflow, both physical experimentation, prototyping, and also like we like to use computation, computational workflows, everything should be documented and disseminated Mm -hmm. as an open source platform for everyone to hop on and see what is happening. And this is actually what's happening in COP26 right now. I read this article um, that they have released a lot of scientific papers, open access to everyone to get access to the completely uh, state-of-the-art science knowledge mm-hmm. and scientific finding about climate change and i think this is a very important factor as an academic institution we are doing a lot of, of this mm-hmm. experimentation but does it go it does it go out mm-hmm. to be available to other people who are looking and seeking for a similar information or is it going to be only like a few pages in portfolio mm-hmm. you know yeah this is an important subject as well definitely yeah i agree Alyssa. Yeah, I just like to, I guess, build on on that. And I suppose I speak, I am speaking more from a public art perspective, mm-hmm. as per my experience. And and I do think that it just needs to be written into more public art strategies mm-hmm. based on councils. And yeah. and I think that I've attended many conferences where there are many of these challenges mm-hmm. where you know certain artists are pitching for using these materials, mm-hmm. but there isn't enough of a drive on the other side. However, if it's written into the strategy, then that will be, you know, one of the boxes that they need to tick. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I think that a lot of the purpose of public art as well, being in the public domain, is to connect to the communities and the narratives around Um, around the area that the artwork will be involved in. And I think the narrative of the material and the history of the material and the place and the people Mm -hmm. there, I think that it's such a strong, it's such a strong foundation to work from, but it often isn't written into strategy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then on top of that, I completely agree about capturing the process and the knowledge dissemination being built on that. And I suppose maybe this is happening in academic institutions, but um, I also think it needs to be like template that could be, mm-hmm. I guess, disseminated out to other educational in- yes. uh, yes. facilities. You know, what about secondary schools yeah, and yeah. primary schools? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I've run many projects in Australia where I was from of working with reclaimed wood and other materials to come and build a project in a school Mm -hmm. and it becomes a a community bridging exercise where the kids parents are outsourcing material from their backyard and Mm -hmm. then they all come together and they're all sharing the story of this and it 
yeah, yeah. that's yes. no I, I think uh, my feeling <laughs> I think the point about kind of the, the you know knowledge dissemination and also having some form of a regulation for reuse and reclamation mm-hmm. really grounds grounds this conversation and the general conversation of reuse mm-hmm. in art and architecture both about how we you know how, how we just extend the life cycle of a material to yeah. as much as we can and not waste and yeah. kind of de- yeah. decrease waste as we go forward and um, just to add yeah. on that and i think another thing it is important to be acknowledging the crisis that we're in but there is also a real beauty and excitement of working with of working with reclaimed material the way that it can engage your imagination it's mm-hmm. just phenomenal and you see it when when children interact with these materials mm-hmm. even more so than adults and i think that that is a quality of play and imagination mm-hmm. and discovery that we can incorporate as yeah, adults yeah into our process Definitely. because they can be the starting point for mm-hmm. really creative ideas mm-hmm. um thank you for the great uh that are really optimistic comment but <laughs> moving on to a little bit of a to hold on to optimism little bit, of a, <laughs> little bit of a serious uh, political discussion around timber um a recent bbc report stated that building the homes of the future will require Wales to become a forest nation. It it said that uh, much more homegrown timber is needed to cut down carbon emissions from construction. Um, Unfortunately, currently the UK imports about 80% of its timber, second only to China. How can art or architecture help in negotiating opportunities for reclamation in this current crisis in the UK, where timber already is largely imported? Um, yeah, maybe any any one of you can start this. I can start on this. I think um, this question can put everything that was said into one big category of what are the points and uh, necessary action is to be taken in order to mm-hmm. revisit and rethink the way we use timber as a material in okay. the art and architecture industry. I think as far as I know, majority of the timber imported into the UK from Sweden. Yes. And then Latvia, I think, somewhere mm-hmm. in the Europe. And um, the reason for that is if me as a person who has no idea how to use a reclaimed material, I wanted mm-hmm. to build something with reclaimed material, mm-hmm. there is not a lot, of, a lot of information for me to use, mm-hmm. to look for. I mean, the point that Elif touched upon about the having a cause and a standard, you can find thousands of thousands of pages books internet pages that can help you to find the standard codes of using concrete new plywood Mm -hmm. how to put them into the practice but there is not enough information about how to use your clay material in that particular context i think this is very important and in academic institution independent from one on each other there are a lot of interesting stuff is happening Mm -hmm. but not a lot of enough conversation Mm -hmm. like initiative to bring them all towards one platform to disseminate this knowledge yeah. um yeah can be kind of distributed distribution exactly mm-hmm. yeah institutions yeah and um i think one part of that is again the the industry if the industry is more and more interested in using these kinds of materials and if mm-hmm. you know as in this case if if they collaborate more with institutions and people who are interested in 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 using these materials you know for building you know, it it will it will create a more public awareness, mm-hmm. right? More more public will will see. Oh, you know, these materials are being used. You know, okay, then perhaps they will also be interested in using them. So mm-hmm. more exposure is what I'm trying to. Yeah, say. definitely. Alisa, any any thoughts? I can basically just second what you're saying. I think it is. It's building the bridges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to? Um, well, actually, I was going to ask about, so the Remerge Pavilion, you guys said you guys calculate the carbon footprint mm. for how the, through the entire process and you recorded a process. Mm. And I just wanted to kind of start a conversation around carbon neutrality and the works we do. Mm. Yeah. Um, let me give you some figures, actually. If this pavilion um, would have been fabricated by, like new plywood the foot the co2 emission of this act that we have done in bedford square would be something around 158 kilo but 
when we used only reclaimed timber and we considered where to look for reclaimed timber yeah. because of the transportation trucks coming going out, yeah. the carbon footprint of this pavilion is something around like five kilo. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's a big difference. Yeah. And this is actually putting a very interesting perspective towards the design space. We as designers and architects always start to design with empty canvas. Let's just design. Mm -hmm. We know a lot of constraints to define this design space, but maybe another constraint to come to display to constrain our design space further down mm -hmm. is this, you know, is to be considered. It's not only the material itself. It's only maybe the, the trips you take to meet your team member. Yeah. That is also part of the CO2. We were actually... We were calculating. We were calculating that. We did. We did. Yeah. The trips we made we, to we meet each other. Maximum. Yeah, we went geeky in yeah, that. Yeah, we did. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, what... I don't want to generalize, but what most of the offices today do, I mean, they do calculate their emissions, but at mm -hmm. the end of the project, yeah. it doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense mm -hmm. because you actually need to start calculating from the start of the project and I mean, as you said, what's the impact on the project? Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, calculating things in the end is kind of a fancy way of saying, hey, you know, we are conscious about carbon emissions, but you haven't actually done much about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I, I, I mean, this is also part of the educational practice, you know, like starting from, as you said, like secondary school or even mm -hmm. elementary mm -hmm. school, you know, what does this imply? You know, that's, I think, very important to think about. Yeah. So it becomes like part of the process, it, not yeah. only as a yes. figure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. To like think about every step along the way, mm -hmm. like all of the materials, that, the submaterials that you're using and the tools and machinery. And I suppose it does. And then you're thinking of, OK, well, what happens to the artwork or the structure afterwards? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make sense to be now thinking like, oh, it would be fantastic to take this to Australia. Mm -hmm. Like, how would that make sense? It yeah. just wouldn't. And I guess it just makes you really think about working locally. Yeah. yeah. And and I suppose that with it was interesting, like working very much within the lockdown to create mm -hmm. reclaimed chaos that I did not have really any options or access to transportation. So I had to do everything by foot mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. majority of the time. And it was it's like how you can really think down very locally and map your local mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I just I just think that um, the you know carbon neutrality is almost becoming like a cultural paradigm as well. You know, it, apart from of course being institutional, scientific, and economical. You know, we have Ooh. carbon trade offsets, and you know, it, its carbon market is up and running as we speak. But as as much as it gets more into the kind of culture of of an everyday routine, mm -hmm. it is more ingrained into um, and also the point about you know working with um, a clean a clean slate I personally find it more interesting that you know we work with the life cycle of a material think about the afterlife of it the before life of it, it kind of creates more opportunities for design itself and and, and art as well um, but these uh, these were the kind of you know questions that we prepared for the discussion but of course if the audience has any questions please let us know and we'll we we can kind of have the room. We 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 just sorry. We just have the mic. <laughs> no, it's because there's a, there'll be more people on Zoom, so we can too. Don't be don't be microphone shy. Thank you. Okay, I have not a question. I have more insights than a question or like sure. idea. <laughs> Great. Observation. Yeah, it's actually very interesting. Like academia influence our future like process. Like we will lead our architectural practice, practice in future. Yeah. And maybe AA itself should make one of the project, like necessary project for each studio to make from reclaimed material, from recycled material. And in this way, people will start to develop new approaches with these materials and it will just be broader developed and uh, it will help yeah, yeah. to take these ideas out of AA. And if it will be like on academic level, not only one project from MTech, but whole academia, yeah. maybe it will influence everything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think that's a very valid point. And definitely, I mean, I think that's also part of what AA Action is trying to do to kind of raise this awareness across the school about 
about climate change and how that can be embedded in our education across mm -hmm. the school. I mean, and you know, I, I, one way, yes, is using reclaimed materials, not only timber, but another important aspect is, is, is if we scale this approach upwards, you know, it's also about reusing spaces. Mm -hmm. So reusing abandoned spaces, for example, you know, like, you know, what's going on on Oxford Street right now, a lot of spaces are being abandoned or underused. You know, what is going to happen to the future of those buildings? I mean, I think there's so much to explore um, pedagogically, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a, a, across various scales mm -hmm. on, on how we can redo things. Mm -hmm. no, we can, kind of we can create a lot of recycling projects and put them in these abandoned buildings. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way. I don't know. I think I think at the A there there is a sort of you know um, a sh pedagogical shift that yes. that's kind of you know ongoing. Definitely. I'm not going to say it's over. It's still ongoing. It There's it's it's a process, and I think as as we kind of have more of these conversations, it will be yes. it will be pushed further. Definitely. Um, any other any other thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah, I think I can say. Yes. Sure. sure. Question. So thank you for the um, for the presentation and your thoughts on on material reuse. But um, for me, it was very focused on timber and this mm -hmm. idea of, of wood. And maybe another word would have been another another title would have been a roundtable on 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 timber reuse rather than on material. For me, I feel it's it's a bit of a catch-22 when the fact that we live in a capitalist society and in order to reuse all these materials or to reuse timber, it, it takes more money. Like, let's be honest, it takes more effort and money to demolish a building with care and to reuse those materials inside of that building than to demolish it from scratch and then rebuild it. Although we have this idea of embodied carbon, maybe that should be the new sort of currency, so to speak. Um, I also find it interesting in how not only timber, but other materials from building sites should be reused. And again, as we, we mentioned earlier, it is very much a, um, uh, an awareness thing. It's this idea that there may be a few reused yards around around the UK, but how aware are other architects of those reuse of those reuse yards? Hmm. Would they prefer to 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 go to those reuse yards to to look at the material to reuse them and design their project around that, or would they prefer to start from scratch? I know as developers, they would prefer to start from scratch. Like there's no no sort of doubt in that. How do we convince those people? to to take reuse of material seriously how do we convince them to say this is better for our environment our design our everything rather than starting from a from a blank table and, and building up building down to the foundations obviously and then building up um, another point maybe carrying on from that is not only the awareness but the the willingness almost to do it like I always find humans are inherently lazy. They always want the easy way out. This, yes, it's it's hard. It's it's you have to actually think about where your materials are coming from, your your entire footprint behind it, uh, the 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 travel costs, the importation costs, the the cutting costs. I noticed, um, Milad, you said the embodied carbon was was compared to that of plywood. What what is the embodied carbon compared to that of timber? Because plywood also has all these processes in, involved: the, the gluing, the, the sticking together, the cutting. That may be. I don't want to accuse you of greenwash, but you may be using plywood as a as a higher carbon material, other uh, higher carbon material than than timber. I'm not sure if the timber would have been less carbon. Uh, that that's obviously up for debate. But just just things like this, which Although we're focusing on one material, it's it's a much wider issue, and it it should be not only the way you speak about it, but also the way we react to it. Now, um, so I suppose the question to you would be how how are you guys, as MTech, as an artist in the the living world, how are you responding to these things? Are you are you full on going into them, or are you 
sort of holding off a little bit just for for, for responsibility and sense of, of of capitalist pride, so to speak. Maybe I can start on this. Um, yeah, to complete my figures. Um, I'm going back to our yeah. I love those figures. We work with numbers. Yeah. With completely new timber planks, the yeah. the CO2 emission, the footprint of this particular project was 142 kilos. Yeah. It was less than plywood, of course, like um, almost like 10 kilo, but it was again, like more than using a reclaim, but going back to your question about, um, I think there is a lack of blueprint and encouragement from other stakeholders in the process. If suddenly there is a rule or a law that make you use reclaim material would be cheaper for you to do it. Yeah. Trust me, everyone do that. Yeah, definitely. You know, they're going to use right now, not reclaim material because it's, more expensive it's way cheaper to do it like from ground up and the way that timber is um i think timber is extremely important material in our industry because it's regenerative you know it's not concrete you cannot grow concrete and um this having timber within the context of architecture aec industry needs to be cemented in all phases of the project, not only just using it as a material, but also using it as a, you seeing it as a material that will be able to be regenerated again. Um, but again, I'm the policymakers here is playing an important role in this project. You know, if there is if there is a reward for developers also to use reclaimed material rather than new materials. And at the end of the budget calculation, their project would be cheaper. They're going to go with reclaimed material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to add a few things on that, you know, there are assumptions that are kind of fit to us because of what the policymakers are saying or what the kind of, let's say, um, important people in the, in the construction industry are telling us. So, you know, they're telling, or, you know, it's cheaper to build it with new material. Not necessarily. Those are assumptions, you know. We, we really need to be critical about those numbers and figures. I mean, how much does it cost to, dis to disassemble a building? And how much does it cost to, to just go to some recycling facility and get some material? It's, it's not like that. So, I mean, I think we need to, and, you know, when you think about, you know, even the policy makers for like climate change stuff, you know, they, they have a position to fulfill, which is around five years, I don't know, maybe six years, whatever. They only think within that time mm -hmm. frame. Mm -hmm. Do they really think about the future of the climate or within, within the time frame they are supposed to fill that role? So I, I think we need to think along those terms as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, really good questions you have, but I just think, you know, and I, it's not a criticism, we need to be a little bit more critical of what we are told, you know, rather than taking, rather than taking these people for granted yep. and these policies for granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, sure. So in regards to the policy making, uh, my master's project was about sort of uh, the reuse of a demolition site mm -hmm. uh, in Elephant and Castle. And section 106 in at least the London uh, demolition code does say that uh, at least I think 85 or 86 percent of the reusable material, mostly it's windows, doors, and so on, has to be salvaged. Okay. The only issue is that most of this is salvaged with the idea to be resold, right. goes into a landfill. Mm -hmm. No one buys it because the idea that a development is built around reused material sounds dirty and cheap, yeah. especially in London with yeah. such a high markup. And so there is policy making around it. They, they at least tried, let's say, attempted it in 2015, but yeah. it it's it's implemented, like I, I think the identity of reusable material, or at mm -hmm. least as you say, like material reuse, should be changed into something which is sort of, uh, yeah. I won't say noble, but like I'd say elite to a degree, rather than being something, it's like, it's like thrifting. Yeah. If you thrift your clothes, yeah. it sounds thrifting. cheap and dirty, like you can't afford new clothes. Yeah. And the development industry, sort of suffers from the same image that if you reuse windows for your sky rise building and I'm paying 600K for a two bedroom, one bedroom apartment, yeah. I don't want that. 
So I feel like the, the policy making is is um, hindered to a degree mm. to, to what the public mm. sort of feels towards their material reuse. Right. A pavilion is always beautiful when you see it. Oh, it's made out of uh, old copper fibers that we mm. reuse from old uh, sort of uh, fiber cables. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And when they actually have to buy stuff, they tell them like, oh, this iPhone is like 50% cheaper, but it's made out of old materials. Definitely. They feel like they're paying for something which is of lesser value. Yeah. Which I feel it's, 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 it's we're, as architects, we're really good at visual communication, but like the marketing mm -hmm. side of it, how mm -hmm. we market our sort of mm -hmm. like concepts, mm -hmm. I think we're lacking a bit on that. And yeah, it's, it's great when you see sort of like visual project like this one, where you, you're actually selling an idea with a notion and narrative behind it for a sort of bigger purpose. Um, I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I have just a, a comment. Um, I was working at a, at a London office that, that deals with, that dealt with a few kind of projects that, you know, historical restoration and, and material reuse as well. And um, yeah, I was looking at um, Chipperfield, David Chipperfield Architects, and one thing that that I kind of took out was how how well they can actually uh, market the the and and kind of sell the idea of restoration and reusing and you know um, not building more or not using new but just reuse with what we have. Yeah. I do understand the point that there definitely needs to be a shift in value, and your point about value is quite quite important that you know an iphone made with old materials is not going to be sold on the same value as an iphone made with new materials so there definitely needs to be a shift in approach and value yeah. of reuse if i may add to that shift um, it's a really good point you brought up there also needs to be a shift in perception mm -hmm. you know how we perceive materials and like you you said you know there's a bad connotation that comes with the word Thrifting, for example, yes, right now there is. And right now there is also a bad connotation about reusing materials because, you know, oh, in my in my penthouse, that's, you know, one million pounds worth. I don't want to have reused timber. Well, I, I'm an optimistic person. I, I think that those perceptions will eventually change in the future, you know, because things are changing in the environment. We cannot just keep going the same way. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, yes, yeah, and a very good point. I mean, it's all of our responsibility to add to that change. I mean, these are just two small projects, you know, mm -hmm. kind of baby steps, but it's all of your responsibility and all of our responsibilities to reflect on this change and to produce more work, mm -hmm. basically. We have one more question uh, from Zahir. It's, it's a few comments. Uh, do you, I, I was just curious if you, uh, where does, you know, a calculation in terms of carbon uh, footprint uh, end? So, you know, does it factor in the carbon sequestered in the timber itself? Or, uh, you know, does it factor in the pret sandwiches of the team, for example? Or, you know, where does that network end? Because it's, it's quite endless. And in a way, also, uh, you know, the way these things are calculated are, yeah. usually according to different conveniences as as, as well. So I, I, I'm not sure personally if it's possible to calculate sure. a carbon yeah. footprint of anything because it's so widely connected to everything else. That's one. And the other is um, I'm slightly critical of um, timber itself as this new material, you know, cross-laminated timber, famously as a solution to all our problems. Uh, because if you look at uh, land use in terms of how uh, timber is a sustainably regeneratively grown, um, you know, vast monocultures are like taking over the landscape and that might prevent the sure. effective sequestration of carbon uh, on a larger land use uh, level as well. And what it might do is through the act of evapotranspiration kind of, you know, uh, dehydrate the soils over long term uh, and, you know, have various implications ecologically. Yeah. Uh, speaking as well. And, you know, I'm just playing the devil, devil's advocate here, but, uh, you know, oh. if, if, if we think of using high carbon footprint material that's, let's say, much longer lasting, mm. um, you know, can we actually offset the carbon? And, yeah. you know, another point maybe that is uh, necessarily looking at the carbon equation, the most effective way of thinking about reuse or thinking about, you know, regenerative building or sustainable building or, you know, whatever these buzzwords are, 
is uh, carbon necessarily the most effective way to approach uh, questions in uh, regards to uh, reuse or mm. uh, you know the broader discussion yeah. that we're having today? No, I mean I think those are very shall I just those are very good points. Um, Regarding the last question you had, uh, or the last point, let's say, uh, we, I mean, at least on our case, and I'm sure you too, we, we are not defending timber. You know, this is the ultimate material because, I mean, as you say, there needs to be an awareness about ecosystem level thinking as well, right? So um, that's obviously very important. These are, these are researches into how we can think about reclaiming and, and carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, we are not, as I said, we are not claiming that these are the ultimate solutions, mm -hmm. but in a, in a kind of a restricted scope, in the scope of research, there are solutions that are valid, right? Um, your other, your first question, your first point was about reuse. Land use, oh, yeah, 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 land use. I mean, yeah, like monoculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think yeah. it's possible I... to calculate a carbon footprint. Yeah, at all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything. And and yeah, exactly. If it's possible to calculate carbon footprint, I mean, obviously, you know, we're we're kind of operating within systems, within systems, within systems, right? And it's an open-ended kind of system in in some ways, and in some ways, it's a very closed system. The kind of world that we are living in. Um, so obviously it would be impossible to calculate all the kind of like history of the carbon, mm -hmm. you know, that came and that we are using and that what's going to happen next to it, you know, this is just beyond the scope, as you mentioned. What we are doing is, you know, we are in this kind of closed system and again, through hierarchies, you know, this is the system we are operating in. What can we, how can we contribute within that system? You know, um, otherwise it's just impossible to deal with all these numbers and figures. I mean, no one has, has done it because it's impossible. Uh, but I think if you come up with some, some questions within a limited, let's say, research scope, mm -hmm. that can then help to answer perhaps other wider questions that, that imply other research questions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I also think like the point that you raised about, I guess, mass planting yeah. um, and monocultures is a really important point. And it just goes to show that there are so many levels and layers of like what it really means to work sustainably. And you can't just like stick a number on something and say like, OK, now our project is sustainable. And I think it really is like it draws to question like broader than just in architecture or in art. It's, it's a broader question of, well, how do we function sustainably in the world um, across many different intersecting sectors? Like, mm -hmm. And I think that you know, health is a really big part of that as well. And I keep coming back to it because I think that we need, you know, we need to be approaching it as a really multi-systemed mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. And regarding like using timber, I think it is, it's a coincidence that we both, yeah. that our projects are both in timber. And oh, um, I certainly am not advocating for only using timber, Definitely. by the way. And um, partly it, it's about what is around. Yeah. And timber was around at that point. Yeah. And, you know, there are so many other materials and you think about different processes of of using materials. And I think yeah. maybe there needs to be more systems developed in terms of like reconstituting and how can we break down yeah. other materials and how could we develop yeah. ways in which we can upcycle mm -hmm. beyond yeah. just, you know, taking a plank and, of wood. And just to add to that, actually, your point about the aspect of time is very important as well. So, you know, everything needs to be calculated against time. So sometimes there might be cases, you know, where it's not about using reclaimed material, but it's really making use of that material for a very long, or let's say a longer period of time mm -hmm. by, you know, um, looking after it, right? Taking care of it. You know, it's not just about demolishing things and reusing them, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I think that really strongly depends on the type of material that we're working with mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I don't know, such as concrete, for example, right? Yeah. You can't I mean, just demolish it and reuse it. So what do you do with those buildings? Mm -hmm. I mean, to add to what you guys said, 
very straight answer to you is that no, you cannot predict or simulate all of the aspects. No, there is absolutely no way because if you follow this thread, you end up with the planet Earth. And there is a field of a study actually to allow a level of abstraction to be done in order for us to understand the impact of changes it's called system dynamics, it started 50s and 60s by John Forrester. And these are like isolated systems. And that's how you can actually study very complicated, bigger systems mm -hmm. that will be at the end, the system of the earth. Mm -hmm. So these all predictions, simulations, insights that has been done and being doing right now in the field of architecture or other fields are just helping us to feel like baby steps to understand the impact of decisions that we make. You know, the pace of change is extremely important. We live what, 70, 80 years? But life continues. The earth continues. If we're lucky. If we're lucky, actually, it's seven years. You know? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, any other thoughts, questions? Just, just one last. Yeah, sure, sure. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that the sequestered carbon is equal to the carbon that is that is burnt off in a, in a piece of wood for heat. So if you were to, to chop down a tree and use it purely for heating your home, it's considered carbon neutral. Yeah. Like, is that not the antithesis of what is wrong with what we are, what we are thinking about, about reuse of material? You're the, I'm not saying that you all would believe, believe this, but the fact that it's third life of your, of your pavilion could literally just be a bonfire and then the rest of the world to say, oh yeah, that's carbon neutral. We've had such requests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that but, called Burning Man? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's Burning Man. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but is that, is that not what's wrong? We're, we're looking too, yeah. too narrowly almost at the... Not though. I mean, yeah. yeah, of course we can burn it. Yeah. You can burn it and yeah, it would be considered carbon neutral. Yeah, it but will be. That's from your heart, you wouldn't believe that to be carbon neutral, no? Would you what, personally? What about I would... my heart or his heart? It's, <laughs> it's numbers. Uh, it's numbers. Yeah. Definitely, it could be burned. That's totally fine. But before, not this one. Like, <laughs> but before, I mean, joke aside. Like, if we can make use of it for a second or a third time before we burn it, why not do that? Yeah, first? exactly. That's that's my that's my my point. Is is that I believe we as humans have kind of gone to the default of. Hmm oh, because it's carbon neutral when we burn it, let's just burn it. They, they, they haven't thought of, can we reuse this timber further? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. And it also comes to the point uh, over here that, that um, uh, we were making about this displacement of people, no? Uh, we kind of think almost one step ahead, not five steps ahead. We don't think the creation of this timber can displace this amount of people, which, hmm. let's be honest, is not sustainable for, for health, mental health any kind of health to those people that live there That's true. Mm -hmm. so it's for me it's, it's just quite um quite eye-opening how how we we have really mm -hmm. only just scratched the surface of material reuse so yeah. yeah yeah very true yeah um i think i think that that was the sure we have one more yeah we can just have one one more question we are a bit tight on time please go <laughs> No, it's fine. No, <laughs> so I just had one observation to make. I think there's a really interesting dichotomy between the two projects that is occurring to me. So if I start rambling, please cut me off. But um, you had been talking about kind of the sensorial characteristics of having walked around and collected this wood and then analyzed it and kind of approaching it from the like material properties that are immediate, like you were talking about the smell of each individual piece of wood as it pertains to different tree type and mm. kind of looking at it and reconsidering the, the, the fastenings and the screws of it. Um, and then I think something that MTech has been doing has been approaching the same material properties using more considerations for the numerical values. Mm -hmm. And you had this you know, video at the beginning where you are taking into consideration this, this body form, right? And your, the, the, way in it, the way in which it emerges to kind of feedback on itself, um, which I think is 
in an intuitive way. And we are currently in a studio where we're talking about, you know, computation and assigning values and ways of reconsideration in that way. Um, which is not to say that one process is more iterative than mm -hmm. another between the two projects, yeah. but like hearing all these like facts and figures from the reemerge pavilion, for example, I think having been on or worked with the fabrication team and like the reconsiderations that had to have been made, even though all of these numbers were in place and not as a criticism, but having to reconsider that though this piece of wood had been selected, when it came time to the actual fabrication of it, more considerations had to be put into place. And I wonder what's the difference if that had to do more with um, the fact that it was built to be self-structural mm -hmm. through an iterative process. And as we were assembling it, had to reconsider how pieces were being put together versus kind of designing a art installation first and primarily for interior and then having to relocate it with kind of more consideration for its new location, which is to say the structural implications of reworking an idea. I just, I think it's yeah. an interesting balance of the yeah. two. Yeah. I think I think before before we answer, uh, sorry guys, this is the last question of the night. Uh, we can have further for the conversations over drinks, but yeah, please please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic observation, and it's something that I really enjoy about having the two projects, you know, sitting beside each other. Is that they are almost working from opposite ends of the spectrum of approach. The way that I've worked with this project is absolutely correct. It's apart from coming out with an aesthetic design, the structural design was very intuitive. And, you know, and I think that that integrated into the concept that I was thinking of, like literally reclaimed chaos. And that is a metaphor for the, the situation yeah. and, and also reclaiming material, but then also working in a more responsive, intuitive way. Mm -hmm. And then each time that the artwork, I'm, you know, I assume I will try to cre create it elsewhere, but this is on a second iteration. It's interesting. It's a different approach to the word even iteration mm -hmm. as well. It's yeah. an yeah. iterative version of a similar concept mm -hmm. using <laughs> repurposing some of its own material. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really about adaptation, mm -hmm. you know, and adapting to a new environment and being, uh, I guess, having an idea in mind and yet being open and responsive to, yeah, to, to working in the present moment mm -hmm. as well. And I think like, depending on, I, I like to think metaphorically and philosophically about the processes of working, which you can't always do. I can't work this way when I'm designing, um, a public art project mm -hmm. I have to work more systematically but that is the beauty of working on these types of projects so mm -hmm. it allows me to be more philosophical as I'm working and think of the metaphor of you know what it is to you know to stand next to somebody and incorporate their expertise in the present moment yeah. and it forces you to be very present mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. and I think that there is a real um there's a lot to learn from different approaches mm -hmm. and yet I also really admire I was looking out of the window at the same time I was like standing in my chaos nest and um, while like, we were in our own chaos <laughs> but to <laughs> my perspective I was like oh okay no you it's like you've you've got a method like you you systematically worked it out and uh, and I suppose right. I really admire the opposite as well you know I think that <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Was, I found that's fantastic yeah. Summary, I think I don't have anything. Yeah. I, I think it's great to have these kinds of conversations yeah. with people who are approaching things in very different ways. I think actually that's more exciting than conversating with people who have the exact same methodology. Yes, yes, because yes. I mean, yes, we are aware of what we are doing, but I'm I was very curious to hear about what Elisa did and mm -hmm. you know she was curious to, to hear about what we did. Mm -hmm. I mean when I first saw her installation last week I was 
for me is I'm like, mm -hmm. how did she build this? Because you know, I'm <laughs> thinking like, about <laughs> assembly methods and sequences, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um how, how did she do this? But so these these are quite interesting conversations. I was like, I I wish we had more of these. Mm -hmm. Um and just maybe as a kind of a final comment from our end, I mean I, I I'm I think it's great you guys are here and that we are having this conversation on, you know, reclaiming reusability, what is happening with the environment. But I do also think that, you know, we're a bunch of people uh, who are gathered here. And I think we need to have more iterations of these talks mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kind of raise more awareness within the AI community. We, yeah. we can be more people here yeah. talking yeah. about this across the school. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very important and we are, all architects and we're at the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. So there yeah. needs to be more initiate more initiatives about about these yeah. issues. Because yeah. yeah. we're all learning. Yeah. Like we're all yeah. learning from each other. Like yeah. I don't feel like I sit here yeah. having answers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's a yeah. it's a process of searching. Yeah. And I think that like that continual yeah. searching process of like yeah. uh, researching, yeah. education, yeah. experimentation, yeah. implementation, yeah. discussing, coming together, pushing each other further yeah. and yeah. interrogating That's very important. our ideas in a playful, non-judgmental yeah. way. Like Definitely. you know. Yeah. To be yeah. rigorous yeah. and yet open and not, you know, not critical Definitely. of each other when we're trying. We're just yeah. trying. Yeah. yeah. We're looking yeah. for answers and we're also learning from your questions. You know, yeah. every time you ask us a question, it makes us think, oh, you know, mm. like, how yeah. can I think about this further? I mean, mm. these conversations are very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Elisa, Elif, and uh, Milan. Oh um thank you yes of course of course um let's <laughs>